Lord God, we just thank you so much, Lord, for this beautiful Sabbath day. We thank you for the fellowship. We thank you for everyone here. We, we pray that you would bless them. We pray for Robert. It's true that we have been missing him this morning, and he is always here. So we pray that you would be with him if he's ill. Give him a speedy recovery. Lord, we just pray that you would strengthen our faith. That, that each of us would be a living testimony. Individually, Lord, we pray that you would help us by the power of your Holy Spirit. Help us to persevere in these terrible, beautiful and terrible times. We pray not that we just only be a testimony in, in life, but even if we are called to die, we pray that we would be a true testimony of faith in our darkest hour, whatever our lot be, Lord. Pray that we would edify you. And we just thank you, Lord, for your parables. We thank you for your spirit. And Thank you for the prophecies, prophecy teachings. It's just so encouraging. Even though all the waves and storms are happening all around us, we're not afraid. We stand strong because you have given us, you've given us the truth. And it's for our increasing our faith as we walk forward in this last days on earth, we pray that we would just be encouraged amidst all the darkness that's happening. There are wonderful truths that encourage us. And we have a great work that's, that's going to be very soon that we'll share some of these truths with people who will be eager, I know there will be, there will be some that will be very eager. And we all look forward to that time, Lord. We thank you for our wonderful elders and the teachings that we're about to, to sit down and study. I pray that you would give us open hearts. Help us to be teachable always, Lord. I thank you again for your presence with us today. Thank you in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Okay, let me go ahead and share screen. Okay, what do you got? Uh, okay, wait, hold on. We see the blue of your computer. Okay, now we see it. The wisdom. Okay, you got my. Okay, good. Oh gosh, good. Okay. Um, if I can get somebody to manage or monitor the chat, and because there's a lot of really great comments and dialogue on there, so I don't want to miss out on that because I, I, I'm not going to put the chat up here. I, I want to keep it simple for me. So, Christine. And, um, you know, I've, I've decided, it's been two weeks since I did my last presentation, and uh, in many ways I'd like to forget that, but. I can't because it was so pivotal, at least for me. And it, um, it started questions in my mind as to, you know, how I study, how I present, and, and also looking at how other people will study and going forward. And so I've decided to start putting the words back on the slides. I think it helps the learning process. Also, if there's any discrepancies in the study, having the words written out really does help because my last study, if I had the words written on the screen, it could have cleared up a lot of the confusion. Um, so for me, it keeps it simple. I'm gonna keep it simple. Um, I, I don't have two devices, just praise God. There's a little much for me. Um, Parminder's recommendation six months ago 
of not reading off the screen is warranted. And I see that it does work really well with most of the presenters in this movement. However, in my situation, I'm still learning and having the words on the screen just makes it easy for me. So I hope that it helps others um, with their learning as well, especially with the PDF version. So mainly I'm doing this because the PDF version, it doesn't help when all you have is pictures and you don't have words. So I have also included um, an excerpt from his first study, because this is a series, there's about six videos that he did in February. And um, so I included a, a, a excerpt from his first video. Um, this is, because this is the third one, this is the third video in this series. And so I did what Christine did um, a while ago in her Manner of the King of the South, which she, which I thoroughly enjoyed. And uh, so I've added that into this and, but it's all, this is all Parminder. And uh, I encourage, I do encourage questions and comments and for better understanding and for, uh, for dialogue and, um, and definitely for the, the chat too, because there's a lot of really good stuff. People comments on the chat. Okay, how do I get rid of this bar again? I forgot. Okay, so go up to your, the toolbar part and okay. and then hover over it. And then when you see the three dots, left click on the three dots and choose hide. I can't remember what it says, hide. Floating medium controls. Excuse me? Is it hide floating medium? Yes, yes hide the floating thing. <laughs> okay, oh gosh, okay. Okay. And do you remember how to bring it back? Um, is it the escape? Key on the keyboard, yes. yes. Perfect. Yes. Okay. All right, here we go. Words on the screens. Yay. Okay, this is the wisdom of Sophia. Just FYI, for me, it's more helpful to have the words because um, yeah. sometimes my mind okay. gets lost and I can, uh, it's easier for me to follow along. So I appreciate it. Thank you. Oh, good. I'm so glad. I'm glad. You know what? And it's just, it's easier for me to present, to tell you the truth. Awesome. So, I mean, I can probably do more studies if I didn't, you know, if I can just make it easy. So this is going to be easy. So I'm just very happy about the fact that I'm, uh, that that's what happened. This is, is, is the result of what happened the last presentation. So I think it was all good then, if you ask me. Sweet. There are no failures. There's only one. Yeah. 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 Amen. Amen. In our studies at this camp meeting, We've been studying the transition from looking at things in the negative to looking at things in the positive. And we've defined those two concepts as two schools of theological thought. Remember this, negative and positive. We've gone over them a number of times, but I'm hoping that we are now familiar and comfortable with these terms. I had a number of reasons why I wanted to introduce these terms and speak about them from these perspectives. First of all, I wanted to show us that God has been leading us step by step. Secondly, I wanted to explain our history, the steps that we have taken using a new term, but integrating that into terms that we're all familiar with. So on the board, you can see John and Jesus, John and Jesus. You can see the Sabbath and marriage, Sabbath and marriage. You can see the four commandments and the six commandments, the four and the six. These are all repeating themes and we should be able to look at our history from these different perspectives. The more we can see things in these three dimensions, it's my hope that we will all have more confidence in the message and that there is nothing new under the sun. The word apophatic means a negative theology. It says, let's try to look at God in a negative way or with a negative mindset. This doesn't mean that you look at God in a bad way. What it means is that when you look at God, you cannot understand him. This is a very conservative mindset, and it borders on mysticism. 
I mentioned briefly about prayer earlier because too many of you are mysticists. You follow ideas and you don't have any idea why. This is a very pagan way of looking at God. It says that you have to appease him and make him happy in order to find favor with him. It's like saying if you return a faithful tithe, the gates of heaven will open. And if you don't, it won't. I've been an Adventist for a very long time, and I've been made ill from Adventist food on a number of occasions. My worst experience was in South Africa. The food was made on Friday. It was not refrigerated. Then it was reheated on Sabbath, and I got food poisoning. The next day, I was on a seven-hour car journey to go to the airport, and let me tell you, it was utter misery. However, they prayed many times over the food, but it didn't do any good. Why do you think people like, why do you think people like this apathetic type of theology, negative type of theology? It's because it limits God. There's always also an opposite theology to this. It's called cataphatic. This means positive. So we have a negative and a positive theology. With this cataphatic type of theology, we look at things in a positive way. <coughs> and it's the opposite of everything we just spoke about. Cataphatic theology says that you can understand God and that you're supposed to understand God. An example of, cataphatic, of the cataphatic way is to say that God is love, and we all know what love is. We know how to do good to people. When we say God is love, we use cataphatic theology because we understand it and we can explain it. But it's also limiting. All human relations are a parable. But what if you don't understand the parable? Can you get any benefit in having human relationships? Of course you can. I'll just call it the mystery of God. So when we say that God is love, this is limiting him because we know what love means. So there are these two different ways of looking at God. One says we cannot understand God, and the other says that we can understand him. Let me ask a question. The incarnation of Jesus, when he comes to earth as a man and becomes the Christ, is that apathetic or cataphatic? Is that apathetic or cat cataphatic? Incarnation of Christ, when he came. It's a positive, cataphatic. It's cataphatic because now we can understand God. At the same time, his disciples say to him that they want to understand God. We have to consider both concepts at the same time. If we only use apathetic model, there's no point in studying anymore because God's ways are past finding out. Romans 11.33. Oh, the depths of riches, both of the wisdom of God and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. If you look at the cataphatic model, now you can understand the love of God. Now you can begin to think about why Jesus came to earth. That's what we attempted to do four years ago in the studies of the nature of man. I read the great controversy statement Ellen White said, if you go to a cataphatic model, you're going to be in trouble. Stick to the apathetic model. So she said, stick to the negative. In other words, stay on the negative. But we could have gone to another book 
and she will tell you that the first duty of a human being is to do what? Does anybody know what the first duty of a human being is? To know God. Our first duty is to understand our humanity or our own nature. Yes, that, that, that's good too. I, I thought the same thing too. But, but when you understand your own nature, you, you, you know God, see, so that's the thing. The nature of mankind, the study of the nature of mankind is a synonym of what subject? The nature of Christ or his human nature. You cannot separate these two. This is one of the most important vows that we have. It's vow number 12. Why is it so critical? Why is the study of the nature of Christ so critical? And I think Fell said it. If you want to understand the nature of Christ, it means you're going to begin to delve into the nature of God. Just like the health reformer, the health reform or medical missionary work, it's the entering wedge of the gospel. So nature of man equals nature of Christ or his human nature. When we first began this study, you probably thought, why talk about these issues? Why introduce Latin and Greek terms? What purpose do they serve? At least one of the reasons why I have introduced these terms is to try to show you that what we are doing is reviewing standard theological ideas, ideas that Christians have been grappling with for millennia. These are not just crazy random ideas that we are just coming up with today. When we are challenging existing thoughts and ideas, it looks like we are in a headlong collision with the spirit of prophecy. But in fact, what is happening is that we are following a tradition of Christianity. He's not the only person, but he's the one who does it often the champion of challenging existing dogma. Does anyone know who I'm talking about? Does anybody know who he's talking about? Jesus. Who? Paul. Paul. Paul the Apostle. I'm hoping that you have listened to studies that I've done in the past where Paul has gone into the Old Testament and turned things upside down. Yeah, here comes our answer we've been looking there for. There you go, yeah. We've been and reading this review. Yeah, you, you posted some video, uh, some snapshots too on um, yeah. Paul's discussion. When, uh, did, you, did you email Parminder about that? No, I asked Aaron. Okay, good. Okay, he takes the Old Testament scriptures and manipulates them for his own use. And what you have to ask yourself is why do you find those things acceptable? Then we come to Ellen White. She's not as bad as Paul, but she does the same thing. She'll take Bible verses and apply them in a literal way, or she'll apply them in a way that suits herself. What is your response to this? If you're a Protestant today, you would say that it's evidence that she's a false prophet. If you're an Adventist, you'll say that it's evidence that she is a prophet because she's clarifying the word of God for us. She's simplifying it. Here we are today, turning things upside down because when Ellen White says you can't time set, we say you can. When she says it's good that women don't vote, we say that's wrong. When she says that mixed marriages are not good, we say that's crazy. We could go on and on. If you start considering some of her ideas about sexuality, which are all based upon false science, we would say that it was based upon craziness and we would reject it. We've already discussed the subject of masturbation as an example, where Ellen White is just repeating the advice of the crazy doctors of her time, not just doctors, but Christian doctors. 
who themselves had a warped understanding of inspiration because they said that masturbation will make you go mad or blind or weak. They said it destroys the spiritual idea of vitality. We know all these things are wrong and it scares people to confront inspiration in this manner. The dilemma that we are faced with today is how do we walk this fine line? Do we completely reject Ellen White and portions of inspiration because they don't fit in with our current understanding of truth? Or do we try to understand these statements in their proper context? This difficulty is causing this movement a lot of pain and heartache. They are what I would call the old God still remaining amongst us. There are those who are still trying to protect inspiration from people like myself, who seem to want to go in and attack. But I want, what I want you to see is that this is not some random fight between myself and the old God. This is a theological discussion on two lines of thinking. I've tried to lay this out in our presentations in this camp meeting because I think those people don't see it. Because you have been taking progressive steps, we have been taking progressive steps over the past five to 10 years. And those first steps were gentle. People were not troubled by them because they didn't see, see what was coming. However, there's one more fearful thing which you have to really come to terms with. It's not just that they were gentle steps. It's not just that those things took you by surprise and you didn't realize it. What we had in our movement was what we call in the English, the elephant in the room. If, do people um, know what the elephant in the room is? I'm just gonna read this. It's the expression, the elephant in the room is a metaphorical idiom in English for an important and enorm enormous topic question or controversial issue that is obvious or that everyone knows about, but no one mentions or wants to discuss because it makes at least some of them uncomfortable or personally, socially, or politically embarrassing, controversial, inflammatory, or dangerous. So that's the elephant in the room. What was that elephant in the room for us? Does anybody know for this movement? Does anybody want to take a guess at what they might think what the elephant in the room was? Time. You know, time. Sexism. Um, okay, one guess. It was a per it was a person. Elder Jeff. Elder, El yeah, Elder Pippinger. It was Elder mm -hmm. Jeff. Yeah. He was that elephant in the room. He had a cult of personality. When he spoke, it was law. No one questioned him. Since he's left, we no longer have a leader of that stature in this movement. A person with a cult of personality that people will just listen to because of who they are. Now, every step has to be won by aggressive warfare. Everything has to be checked. Everything has to be justified. And that means that our message progresses slower. I'm just stating things as fact. There's no complaint. So that's just a short summary of what we've been discussing so far and the reason why I've introduced these topics. Okay, I just want to talk about a random thought not connected to our study. The word homo sapien. This is two separate words. What language is this? Does anybody know what language this is? Latin. That's right. It's two Latin words that come together. What does, what does homo mean? Does anybody know what homo means? Man. Man. Okay, the yeah. Thing. Man, human, yes. What does sapien mean? Anybody know that? I think somebody said it, it was same. Oh, okay, wise. Wise. I thought it was same. This is, um, uh, so homo sapien, uh, oh wait, 
Yeah, so it means wise. So I thought that one of those words, I thought it was homo, but it's been not fresh in my mind that he said was um, same. Yeah, okay. Well, yeah. Well, You're we'll, going to get to that. Okay. Get to that. Yeah, okay. Okay. So the word homo means human and the word sapien means wise. So you have the man who is wise compared to other creatures. It's distinguishing us from other, creature, from other creatures. Here's another word, homosexual. What language is this? Does anybody know what language this one is? English. Mm, okay. Homos German. Uh, I think it has a German, yes, it has the origins from German, but homosexual is a hybrid word. And if I can, if he can call it, it's a composed of two languages, Greek and Latin. This is Greek, Latin. In the Greek, homo means same. And of course in Latin, sexual means sex. The word homosexual is a hybrid word from Greek and Latin, which basically means same sex. It has its origins in Germany. I just wanted to share this tidbit with you because we were already studying Greek and Hebrew, but it, it has nothing to do with our study. So in the Latin, homo means human, but in Greek, homo means same. So that's the difference. This is just a little tidbit he threw in there. Since we're talking about funny words, I'm gonna give you another word. It's anthropomorphism. This word has to do with the personification of things. You can take an object and then you can give it human characteristics. If you watch cartoons, you have these animals that can talk or you may think about the sun or the moon having human characteristics. All of these are anthropomorphic concepts or ideas. The reason why I introduced this word is because the Bible does. Is God male or female? In the Bible, it speaks almost exclusively about God being male or a man. Is that factually correct? Is God male or is he female? What I wanna suggest is that whatever is happening here is an anthropomorphic concept. What humans have done is taken a human construct and projected it onto God. Or, depending on how you want to see it, God created male and female, and he projected it, projected unto us these biblical models explaining himself as male. If he wants to talk to us, he has to come down to our level so that we can understand who he is. Some people said that God is both male and female. For those people who think that, I wonder if they can send me a picture of what he looks like below the waist. I don't mean to be disrespectful or, or crude to God. I just think it's crazy to think that God is both male and female. At least amusing, if not crazy, because I thought God was spirit. I thought he created humans. I'm not very good at artwork, but I wanna draw a picture of myself. Here I am. This was created in my image. It even looks like me, but it's not me. It's nothing like me. For one thing, I'm three-dimensional, and this drawing is two-dimensional. The colors don't even match. I could get someone else to do a, better, a much better job drawing me, and that would be a better creation of my image. All I want to say in this silly example is just because we were created in God's image doesn't mean God is either male or female. I'm not asking what science says. I'm dealing with inspiration. For those people who say the Bible says that Jesus is male, and I'm not going to listen to any other version, you have not listened to the presentations that we've been doing in this camp meeting. Anybody have any more, any comments up until now? Or anything in the chat to share? Okay. You're stuck. Those people are stuck 
in the dark ages under the ministry of John, and you want to hold on to mystical ideas because you feel uncomfortable thinking about the truth. There's no denial that when Jesus was incarnated, he came as a man, but that doesn't mean that God is male. Such conclusions would be based on false understanding of parabolic teaching. When God created humankind in Genesis 2, what was the message that he was sending? Was he trying to show us that male and females are different? So when God created Eve, is she portrayed different or is she the same? Let's turn to Genesis 2.20. And Adam gave names to all cattle and to the fowl of the air and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found an helpmeet for him. When he looked at everything, he couldn't find anything that was the same as him. I don't know how many of each animal was created, but when he saw two dogs or two cows, they looked the same and they were friends with each other. When he looks around, he only sees one of him, one of his kind. So we know what happens. God puts him to sleep. He takes a rib out of Adam, which is the same as his other ribs, and he fashions a woman. Then what does Adam say? Does he say, oh, look, you're so different. Your body shape is different from mine. No, you have a repeat and enlarge that Eve is exactly the same as Adam. They are not called Adam and Eve at this moment because Eve hasn't been given her name yet. So what we see in the verses is not that they're different, it's that they're the same. She's identical to him, bone of his bone, and flesh of his flesh. They are identical, not different. That's the primary lesson that Genesis 2 is trying to teach us. You know, when it says that he created the animals, it doesn't specify male and female. He just gave them one that was, they had one that was like them. But mm, it was right. Male and female. right. So the... So, I mean, he could have just put us, put all, I, I, I don't know, I'm, maybe this is a, for discussion, <laughs> but I'm just thinking, he could, because he put all the animals there, right? Yeah. They didn't have to, they didn't have to be male and female. They didn't necessarily have to procreate, right? They, they to, you know, to have babies and, and all of that. <clears throat> but he didn't do that with humanity. He he did make them to where they could procreate, but he didn't have to do it that way. You know what I mean? He right. Well, and, and he saw that they, they were friends. I mean, like they were like a, a group of the same animals. And he was like, well, where's, how come I don't have that? You know, it's a good argument. It's, uh, it's perceptive that he saw that. So I'm just going to read the scripture. And the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon Adam. And he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. And the rib, which the Lord God had taken from man, made he a woman and brought her unto the man. And Adam said, this is not bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. So in a sense, she is man. Is it, does it, a child come out of the womb? Woman. Yeah. Yep. The issue of masculinity and femininity is going to repeat itself throughout scripture, and it's given in many different examples. We've spoken about man and woman, male and female. Now we'll give another example, the sun and the moon. The sun represents male and the moon represents female. I'm going to give you three examples, man and woman, sun and moon, God and creation. There are others, but we'll just go with these three. They're all parables. What God is going to do is take these three examples and in their own unique way, they all have a repeating theme, either in their physical being or in their function. So let's go with the sun and the moon. 
what's the purpose of the sun and the moon? We don't have to guess because it tells us in Genesis 1 to give light. They are both there to give light, one for the day and one for the night. However, there is a substantial difference between the two. When we get light from the sun, it's the originator of that light or the giver of that light. But when it comes to the moon, it receives light and then it reflects it. When you start looking at these two objects, you have the giver and you have the receiver, but they both have the same function, which is light. They're identical. There's no difference between them. Just like Adam and Eve, bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. However, there are subtle differences that God wants to show us. He's going to portray one from a female perspective and one from a masculine perspective because he wants to show us the full spectrum of light. God gives us light and he gives that light in different ways. When it's direct, it has that masculine concept connected to it. When it receives, it has a feminine concept connected to it. What God is trying to teach us is that he's the giver of light and he will give that light in different ways to teach us his graciousness. Isn't that beautiful? He's always trying to teach us in the ways that he knows that we will, we will understand it best. I mentioned three examples, sun, moon, woman, uh, man, woman, God, creation. I'm going to do another one, and I'm going to call it God and the Holy Spirit. It has the same modeling. So now I'll give you four. Let's go back to the story of Mount Sinai. God is hidden behind clouds, and the people don't want to look at him. There's lightning and thunder, and he's hidden behind all of this, but God still gives light. Moses climbs up the mountain, and he stays there for a while. What begins to happen to Moses when he stands in the presence of God? It's like what happens to you when you stand in the presence of the sun. You absorb that sunlight. You might even get a suntan. Moses absorbs this light. He comes back down the mountain and he's going to start giving off this light. But it's not his light because it's a reflection of God. Here's an example of these two models. Model one is the sun and the moon. And model two is God and his created beings. We can see that there is consistency in this model. The object is light. God's people need light. They get it directly from God or from his creation. When it comes from his creation, it's a reflection of God's light. What God is doing is teaching us about himself. He's going to play games. He's going to show us about the giving and the receiving. When it's in the giving mode, it's masculine. And when it's in the receiving mode, it's feminine. Let's look at man and woman. Without getting too graphic, you can see in their physical organs that one is the giver and one is the receiver. We all know what happens at intercourse. When a man penetrates a woman, he gives and she receives. When he ejaculates, he gives and she receives. What we're seeing here is the creation of life. And it's all a reflection or an explanation of God. How God gives and how he receives. And it's all explained through the gender model, male and female. Isn't this amazing? I just, I mean, he's just it's just amazing how God teaches us. When we speak about God and creation, 
and we see him doing things, it's him in the masculine. When you see him explain through creation, it's him in the feminine, like the mother hen. Is it male or female? It's feminine. What you see when you start looking carefully is that God is going to describe himself in masculine and feminine terms. When you see godliness revealed in creation, you'll see it in feministic terms. When you see God pouring out his goodness, you'll see it in masculine terms. I noticed that once before where, he was, where God was describing himself as a female hand, a mother hand, and I had paused on it, but it never clicked, you know? Yes. It's him in the, in the, in the receiving mode. It's just, it's just genius, really. I mean, of course it's genius, but I mean, it's just like, wow, it's the perfect, I mean, we never understood it though, you know? So when we see it in his creation, it's him in the feminine mode. The Bible is a storybook about God and his goodness. He's the God who gives. <clears throat> So it's no wonder the vast majority of the time you see God portrayed in the masculine. What's the most important thing that we can get from God that we need besides love? Let's go to the book of Proverbs. And what we want to do is search out Sophia. Hopefully we all know Sophia. It's this beautiful woman. Let's go to Proverbs 1. Wisdom crieth without, she uttereth her voice in the streets. She crieth in the chief places of concourse, in the openings of the gate. In the city she shuddereth her words, saying, How long, ye simple ones, will ye love simplicity? And the scorners delight in their scorning, and fools hate knowledge. Turn ye at my reproof, behold, I will pour out my spirit unto you. I will make known my words unto you because I have called and ye refused. I have stretched out my hand and no man regardeth. But ye have said it not all my counsel and would none of my reproof. So what is Sophia? Does anybody wanna? A woman. She is wisdom. You know. Then she starts laughing at you when you carry on through the verses. This is Sophia. You can go and study her if you like. She's obviously female. Who is she? I would suggest she is information or words. You might call it logos or the word. You might call it Jesus. We don't have time to prove what I'm saying, but wisdom are these words. It's what Sophia speaks to you. The words, the word, the logos. And who is the word? Jesus. Yet people tell me that Jesus is a man, but it's clear from inspiration that Jesus is female. We need to be very careful about how we read and not make rash judgments or statements. When the Bible speaks about a masculine God, it's not because God is male. Yeah, and do you guys remember when we, went, we spent some time looking at Proverbs? Yes. And we could see there was there was both male and female represented. Yes. There. The thing that I'm, it's going back to our construct of male and female, because like we're, we're saying it in what we're saying right here is that a female um, has specific characteristics, but it's it's not really true. Um, there there are female characteristics, but that doesn't. I don't think I'm explaining myself right, but not all females are, you know, huggy, loving, nurturing, yeah. and not all males are not. Right. And so there are female characteristics, but that doesn't mean, you know what I'm saying? I, I, I think um, we, we still have to be careful uh, not to, um, uh, what's the word? Stereotype? Yes, yeah, stereotype men and yes. men. And, uh, same, yeah. same with men, you know, to to um, because you could have the manly man and then the more feminine man. You, you know what I mean? Yeah. 
exactly. So I don't, I, I'm, I'm not going to go as far as saying Jesus is female, but he has what we call female characteristics. Yeah. But they're, they're not. It's just that God encompasses all of those characteristics. And we he just gives us, the, he gives us the parable of the giver and the receiver. Mm -hmm. yes. right? right. And, and, uh, and the marriage was to teach us a lot of things. The marriage was to teach us that not because a man has to go find a woman and marry and produce a baby, but so that we could understand in terms of God giving us Jesus, giving us the word, giving us, you know, and, and, and being like when you put in the, there was something that Christine just put in the chat maybe to bring up, but, or was it Christine? It was Susan. The receiver then in turn also gives what is received. They give right. birth to something. Yes. So, but it doesn't, you, we're looking at the literal, it gives, you know, the woman right. gives birth to a baby, but right. you, when you get, when you get this, the word of God and, and you, re, you know, it's given to you and you receive it, it produces fruit. Right. Yes. And I, 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 I believe that, um, you know, uh, a, an easy way to look at it is that when God, God's the ultimate, he's, he's the great giver. And when he gives in the masculine, it's directly. But when he gives in the feminine, it's indirectly. You know, he might do it through a person or through, a, through his creation. You know, the, so um, that's, to me, that makes it easier for me, is the masculine is direct giving, giving it directly. And the feminine is um, giving it indirectly. Uh, good comments. Very, very good. Appreciate that. Thanks. I'm going to change subjects for a bit. What's the purpose with the Hebrew language? The problem with Hebrew is that it's simple. What's the advantage with the Greek language? Why is Greek good? Because it's complicated. The problem with Hebrew is that it's too simple. If you want to describe something in Hebrew, you've got two choices, male or female. You don't have anything in between. I can't say that this pencil, it, is non-living. In Greek, I can, because in Greek, I can make this pencil, this pencil non-gender. However, in the Hebrew, because it's a basic language, it doesn't let you do that. Like I said, I'm not a Hebrew or Greek scholar, so I'm only explaining things in a simple way, but I think it is accurate. In Hebrew, if you talk about anything, you have to give it gender, either male or female. You don't have a choice. You can see how difficult it is for God. I don't know why he chose Hebrew. He's stuck because everything is going to have a gender to it. Remember what God is trying to teach us about himself. Remember that God is trying to teach us about himself. The giver is masculine. He's also a receiver, or, he's, or he has agents who receive to give. Just like wheat. Wheat is going to receive sunlight, absorb it, and give you something in return. All of these concepts are going to be compartmentalized into masculine and feminine terms. It's not because God has gender. He's not male or female, he's neither. It's not because men are superior to women. What did Adam do in Genesis two? He gave up himself. So therefore, he's going to be defined as masculine ter in masculine terms. Eve is going to receive the bone. So she's going to be a man, the feminine version of a man, which is woman. It's not because there's some hierarchy between them. It's just to explain to us the two facets of God, how he thinks and how he operates. He gives and he receives, and we see this over and over again. So is this a little bit more clear? Yes, thank you. Version and yes. So and he says Eve is going to receive the bone, so she's going to be man, the feminine version of man, which is woman. So it's just really interesting. So when we start thinking about God and we start thinking about the Father and the Son, you can begin to see how incorrect it is to believe that God is a Father and that Jesus is a Son. 
In the book of Proverbs, Jesus isn't even born yet, and he's the Lagos, the word, and his name is Sophia, woman, feminine. Why? What was Jesus doing in heaven? Was he standing equal to God? What was Jesus doing in heaven? Anybody? Any, anything in the chat? He was working with the angels. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. And so therefore he was, he stands as a servant. Right. No. So he was, was he standing equal to God? No, he stands as a servant. If you can remember Elder Tess in her first representation, she discussed this dynamic. We can really be thankful for the spirit of prophecy. As she explains the nature of Jesus, not just that he's a man, but that in heaven, he's receiving from God and giving those blessings to people like the angels. So he has this feminine characteristic, and that's why he's called Sophia in the book of Proverbs. It's an aspect of God. It's not a separate God. So it's an aspect of God, not a separate God. It's explained in a different way. And when it's done that way, it's given feminine characteristics so that we can learn better. What's so crazy about human beings is that almost every gift, every tool that God has given to us, we have abused. The ceremonial system, human relationships, animals, plant life, anything and everything. All of those things are meant to teach us, and yet we have destroyed those models. Uh, ain't that the truth? I mean, we have literally destroyed every, everything God has given us and we've destroyed. We've run out of time, but I want to leave you with this closing thought. What, hap what happens every 24 hours? What marks a new day? What marks a new day? Oh, the question on the sunrise. I just, I just shared this with somebody else the other day. Okay, yeah, yeah, I think I remember that. Some of you said sunrise and sunset. Of course, we know that is completely wrong because we are going back over a thousand years into the dark ages of Catholicism to say sunset. We do know, we do know that the sun never sets, don't we? And we do know that the sun never rises either. The sun stands still and we move around it. So this is not a sunrise or a sunset. This is an earth rotation. The last time someone mentioned this subject, they did so at the peril of their own life. Does anyone know who that was? Does anybody know who was? Yeah, I'll live. Yep, that's right, Galileo. He risked his life to say there is no such, such thing as a sunset. And I want us to think about that because even though it's just a random thought, it relates directly to our subject. It's dogma that's been taught for a thousand years and time does not make it truth. Galileo's championing of Copernican Heliocentrism, which is Earth rotating daily and revolving around the sun, was met with opposition from within the Catholic Church and from some astronomers. The matter was investigated by the Roman Inquisition in 1615, which concluded that heliocentrism was foolish, absurd, and heretical since it contradicted the Holy Scriptures. And Galileo was sentenced to life in prison in 1633. And because of his age and poor health, he was allowed to serve his imprisonment under house arrest. And he died in January 8th, 1642, at the age of 66. So he was imprisoned for the rest of his life for that, for that truth. You see how that false uh, dogma taught is just, it, it kills, it kills people. I just want us to remember 
that as we move through our studies, not just at this camp meeting, but also moving forward, remember this anthropomorphic concept that God has given to us? He portrays himself as masculine and feminine because he created us that way to teach us about who he is and how he operates. He's the giver God and the receiver God. When I say the receiver God, I don't mean that he wants something from you because he's all giving. He either gives directly or he gives indirectly. And this is the masculine and the feminine concept that inspiration wants to teach us. I've answered the question that someone asked, from whom does God receive? But that's not the concept. Jesus said, I can do nothing of myself. I can only give you. I can only give you what I receive from the Father. Crazy people think that means that Jesus is a lesser being or a lesser God, that he doesn't have any power. That's why it's so crazy. The great controversy is all centered around the divinity of Jesus. He is verily God, and yet he says, I can do nothing unless I receive it. See that feminine? It's just beautiful. All the puzzles are, are fitting into place. This is parable teaching. He wants to teach us how God operates. He gives directly and he gives through his agents. It gets so involved that one of these agents actually is Jesus, who is God. Ezekiel would call this wheels within wheels. The whole concept of man and woman, masculine and feminine, is not about headship or who is superior or who is inferior. It's about how God in interacts with his creation. And you see these two ways that God deals with his creation. The best way that he could explain it is by making those two humans one that gave and one that received. In the example of human beings, that modeling is done physically. We really need to understand that because we need to be able to, well, we need to be able to make these arguments to people when we talk to them. Yes. We need to be able to separate out our, what's the word I think um, Christine used, it, the construct in our mind and look beyond the literal and, and rather look beyond and see what it is what that example is teaching us yes and it goes against our um what you call our just our human nature you know to just react and we have to stop reacting in our minds and start pausing and thinking and starting to slowly change our minds so that we can everything see. being a parable yeah it has to teach us something yes so Let's pray. God, dear Lord, we thank you. We thank you for humanity and we thank you for your divinity. As humanity and divinity combine, let us help us to understand the parable of the masculine and the feminine. Help us to see your goodness and your wisdom and help us to embrace the wisdom that we find in the book of Proverbs. She stands outside crying to be heard. May each of us be willing to open our hearts and receive her. Bless us to this end, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, that's it. Well, actually, there's, there's more. <laughs> I know that's it to your presentation. Oh, yeah, no, there's two more. I'm, I've got two more. Got two. Yeah, no, um, this, was, this was wonderful because... This brings up, at least in my mind, so many more questions than answers. Uh, yeah, this was a great presentation. Um, yeah, either I have not heard this presentation before, I somehow I missed it, or, yeah, because I don't remember this presentation at all. I mean, this is all new to me. 
Yeah, I vaguely remember it because I remember this, the wisdom of Sophia. I remember that, but he did this in February of last, you know, so it's almost a year. Almost a year. Yeah. But it's, it, it's I mean, because one thing that I know in, in my mind that why, you know, we get this so wrong and so confused is because we are so focused on the act, the sexual act, the, 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 the male, the giver, you know, and the female, the receiver, therefore the male is dominant and the female is submissive. And, and we, and e even sexuality and, and, you know, in America, uh, sexuality was a taboo to talk about sex was a taboo, oh, yeah. you know, even, even heterosexual relationship, just, just a whole, anything that has to do with sex was taboo period. You know, the, the women having periods, men, you know, uh, menstrual cycle, that was a taboo. Everything that was sexual was a taboo. Even the heterosexual now, even now, you know, uh, placing that in, into homosexual, that's even a more taboo because the act is more, you know, seemingly repulsive because it's all about the act, you know. Um, and I, th I think, and I don't, it's, it's the general conference, their stance in homosexuality is, it's okay to be homosexual as long as you don't act upon it. Mm. Mm. You know, we'll accept you as, as homosexuals, but just don't act upon it. Uh, so, you know, it's, it's really about the act. And we, I think we got this whole thing wrong. And I, and, and at least to my mind, you know, we've, you know, we, as human beings, you know, we've, we've been growing up, growing up with, with the, um, the wrong concept. And at least in my mind, I think it, it may do me good to just, to just, um, uh, read this this um the presentation over and over and over and over again just to combat this wrong idea of sex of sex and sex and how it's taboo and it's wrong and you know blah 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 right right um you know it's getting better i mean you know more people are speaking about periods and sex and homosexuality you know you know and lgbt but i think in the church it's never changed i mean they're just you know, in the church, even even in Adventism, nobody wants to talk about sex. I mean, why? God forbid somebody say penetration and intercourse. I mean, I mean, I don't think we'd ever hear that, you know, in a church or even or much less. I don't even think a pastor would even say those words in the pulpit. Right. right. It's, a, it's a taboo subject. Yeah. It keeps them in power. Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Oh, and and, and that. Uh, that video that Tess put on the um, the media broadcast about that Adventist pastor that was saying that uh, husbands should rape their wives. And I, I mean, that is just, oh my goodness. I just couldn't believe that. Yeah, so, so, yeah, so here's, the, here's one of the wrong concepts that I always have to shake out of my mind. And... And that is this. So, and, I, and, I, and I'm being uh, honest here, unfortunately. Uh, but, you know, so here on earth, you have a, a male and female, husband and wife. And that's the, the, uh, the, the, the correct hetero relationship. And homosexuality is wrong. Okay, this is my previous thinking. So then in my mind, I'm trying, I'm trying to put this concept together of how my relationship with God is right when he's a man and I'm a man and he wants to marry me. It's like, what does that make us in, in the wrong mind, in the wrong mindset? What does that make us? That make us homosexuals. If, you, if, if you're following my logic. And then, I, and I could, I could never put that together until now. Are you understanding my logic? Um, could you explain that one more time? I, I okay. am, because uh, that was always a problem for me too. Um, so, 
fella saying that as a guy, you know, like God is saying, uh, you know, I want to marry you, right? But he's a guy and God's a guy. So then the two would be homosexuals. So now that we understand God is neither, it, it makes a big difference in that thinking. Yeah. Right. So there is no right or wrong. Mm -hmm. it well, well, it was wrong before because before homosexuality was wrong. This was before. Mm -hmm. And if God's a man and I'm a man and he wants to marry me, it's like, we're homosexuals and we're wrong. And so, you know, so that wrong concept was always difficult hmm. for me to uh, make sense. It just never made sense. And I always, as soon as I thought that, that, that we're homosexuals, I had to like get rid of that thought right away. Mm -hmm. Kind of interesting when you think about how the, mar the marriage is a, as a parable as well, because when, and the Bible says when a man takes a, takes a wife, right, they, they too become one flesh. But we look at it as male and female, the literal, as it speaks. But it's giving us a parable of how, of what marriage is. Right. And God wants us married to him to be one with him versus married to Satan and being one with him. Right. Because God looks at things spiritually and we're always looking at things literally. And that's our problem. Yeah. To be one with him is to be like him. To be one with Satan is to be like him. Right. So understanding the masculine and feminine is real important. The, uh, the masculine and feminine characteristics of, of God is it's, it's the way he gives, you know, he gives either directly or indirectly. Um, and you can even, and, and, and even Parminder said with uh, Eve, she's man, she's woman, woman, she, you know. And in every relationship, you have to have that give and receive. It, and it goes both ways, not just the man to the woman. I mean, both ways, uh, uh, the guy has to receive her kindness or, I mean, not that just kindness, but, um, you know, it goes both ways. 